seated. Michael and Marco are here today to express their deep love for one another and to be united in holy marriage. And as they stand before you, their earnest desire is that this service and this union into which they are about to enter would honor their Lord Jesus Christ above all. On this very special day, they have freely chosen to enter into a marriage covenant. And the covenant of marriage stands as a beautiful symbol of the supreme love that God has demonstrated in the sending and in the sacrifice of His own Son. And just as Michael has taken the initiative in establishing this covenant relationship with his bride, it was God who took the initiative to establish a covenant with us, his bride, the church, by sending Jesus Christ to this earth to redeem us so that whoever might believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. This covenant marriage into which Michael and Marco are entering today it extends beyond the contractual marriages that many choose today. While a contract is based on distrust, a covenant is based on trust between two partners. While a contract is based on limited liability, a covenant is based on unlimited responsibility. While a contract protects individual rights and needs, a covenant prioritizes commitment to the relationship. And while a contract has limited terms, a covenant is permanent. There are many symbols in a wedding. The rings, the flowers, the color white, and even the center aisle, which represents the parting of halves in ancient covenant rituals. And your presence here today is a symbol as well. A covenant is not binding unless there are witnesses. So as Michael and Marco enter into this covenant, they've invited you, their closest friends and relatives, to serve as witnesses. You're not merely spectators or observers. You are participants. You're bearing witness to this covenant and you're making a commitment to support and encourage this couple in the months and in the years to come. Marriage is not only the oldest of human institutions, but it's also the holiest. God himself established marriage in the Garden of Eden and throughout his scripture, God reminds us to hold marriage in high honor. And therefore, marriage vows are not to be taken lightly, but reverently, deliberately, and in accordance with the purposes for which God has established this holy union. So let all who are present here today consider the solemnity and the permanence of the vows that are made. And for those of you who are married, let this be an opportunity for you to recommit yourselves to your own marriage vows as you listen to the sacred promises that Michael and Marco pledged to one another in the very presence of God. Michael, will you have this woman to be your wife, to live together in the covenant of marriage, and will you, by God's grace, love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live? Marika, will you have this man to be your husband, to live together in the covenant of marriage, and will you, by God's grace, love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, be faithful to him as long as you both shall live. Michael, as you come before God and these witnesses, are you signifying that you're taking the initiative in this marriage covenant, and that you are, by the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, assuming the greater responsibility in carrying out its terms? Rick, by walking down the aisle with Marco, are you affirming that you and your wife Debbie are giving your full blessing to the marriage of your daughter to this man, and that you're hereby transferring your God-given responsibility for the care and protection of your daughter to this man? Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, by your grace and according to your will, you have brought your son Michael and your daughter Marco together to be unbreakably joined today as husband and wife. And we're gathered together today, first and foremost, to worship you. May you be honored in what we say and do in this ceremony. We're also gathered to witness the establishment of this very special and very serious covenant. We ask for your blessing on Michael and Marco as they make their vows before you today. Fill them with your joy, fill them with your love, and make them a radiant example of your grace. We commit this ceremony to you and pray that all that is accomplished here today will be pleasing in your sight. 
And we pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as we sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness. The words are found in your program.
Michael and Mariko. Today you're being united in holy marriage. You walked into this ceremony as two individuals, but you've freely and deliberately chosen to stand before God and these witnesses in a covenant to become one flesh, to become partners for life, to become husband and wife. And as your pastor and as your friend, I consider it a great privilege to preside over this ceremony today. God's original design for marriage called for two equals, male and female, made in his image, to come together and to form a team that would manage all that he created. He designed the man and the woman very differently so that they would complement one another. But after the fall, God's intentions were so deeply distorted by sin that now those very differences, differences are often not the source of joy, but of pain and heartache. And as you enter this covenant with your family, Michael on one side and your family, Marco, on the other, it's only fitting for us to remember the unconditional covenant that God established with Abraham to begin his address of humanity's problem of sin. God and Abraham did not walk through the parted halves of the sacrificed animals together as was the custom in ancient rituals. Instead, while Abraham slept, God himself walked through the parted halves. He alone would be responsible for carrying out the covenant's terms. And God has proved his faithfulness by sending us his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sin by dying on the cross and to give us hope for eternal life by rising from the dead. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he pleaded with his closest friends to pray for him as he faced the terror of the cross and his father's wrath against sin. But just like Abraham, Jesus' disciples fell asleep. He alone would bear the full weight of the responsibility to carry out the terms of a brand new covenant, a covenant in his blood. Michael and Martha, you both stand here as recipients of God's mercy under this new covenant. In his gracious loving kindness, God has transferred you now from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And now he's transforming you into the likeness of Christ so that you might reflect his glory. And I know this because I've had the privilege of seeing what he's done in your lives, both separately and now, together as he's drawn you to marriage. I've witnessed your initial steps of truly dying to self as the Lord has placed you on this path. Before you make your vows, I want to remind you of two specific connections between the good news of God's grace to us in Christ and this marriage into which you are about to enter. The first connection is that marriage is an illustration of God's grace. While it's true that each of us who places trust in Christ for salvation, it be, we become a trophy of God's grace and mercy individually. But God draws some people to marriage so that they might display His glory and His grace and His mercy together. In the special relationship that exists between a husband and a wife, God has given us a perpetual symbol of Christ's love for the church. This is the magnificent meaning that God intended for marriage when He created it. But the degree to which people see the gospel in your marriage, the degree to which you reflect God's grace and His glory, will depend on the degree to which you love one another in accordance with His Word. So it's helpful for us to turn to His Word for a description from David of God's loving grace in the psalm that Maggie just read. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. These descriptions of God describe His sacrificial, self-giving nature. God's love is active. He chooses to pardon. He chooses to heal. He chooses to redeem. He chooses to restore. And He chooses to satisfy. And, he, and he's chosen to fill, fulfill all these promises ultimately through the sacrifices of his own son, Jesus Christ, who himself declared, greater love has no one than this, than one who lay his life down for his friends. If you're to display the true love of God together in marriage, you must first understand this principle of sacrificial love. Our culture tells us that being in love is a feeling, and when that love disappears, that feeling disappears, well, perhaps it's time to move on. But such a notion is completely foreign to the nature of God, whose loving kindness is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. 
And that's because of Christ's sacrifice. The key to staying, staying married is not staying in love, but keeping the covenant promises that you will make before God today. This will require countless personal sacrifices. 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible's famous love chapter, uses 16 adjectives to describe love, and not one of them is a feeling. Every single one of them represents an aspect of God's character, a byproduct of faith in Jesus Christ empowered by His Spirit. Love is a daily choice. It's a volitional act of the will that becomes possible when we first receive the love that God has extended to us through His Son. So Michael and Mariko, as you're joined together today, it's not merely to meet the requirements of the state, nor is it simply to satisfy your desire to live under, live under the same roof. You're here today because God has chosen you to glorify Himself together as two, no longer as individuals, but as one married couple. The purpose of your union today is to illustrate to the world, albeit in an imperfect way, the perfect love that God has demonstrated to His people through His Son. Marriage is a visual aid of the glorious gospel message of Jesus Christ that has made a relationship with God Himself even possible. From this day forward, your new life together as one flesh will serve as an enduring icon of the great bridegroom Jesus' sacrificial love for us as his bride, the church. How you love one another in sacrifice and submission will speak volumes to those who know you. Michael and Marco, your committed love in marriage will be an illustration of God's grace. But marriage is more than an illustration of grace for the watching world. There's a second connection that we see between the gospel of Jesus Christ and marriage. 1 John 4.12 proclaims, If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. While it's true that marriage is an illustration of God's grace, it's also an instrument of God's grace. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Ephesians that marriage is, is one of his tools that he uses to sanctify his people so that we might become more like Christ. Marriage changes us and refines us. It serves as a catalyst for growth. Whenever two sinful people come together, there will always, always be conflict. And the degree to which God uses your marriage as his, his instrument will depend on how you handle this conflict, how you receive His grace in response to your own sin, and how you give grace when your spouse sins against you. Through Christ, God pardons all of your iniquities. Through Christ, God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Through Christ, God has not dealt with you according to your sins, nor rewarded you according to your iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed your transgressions from you in Christ. If you truly understand and embrace this wonderful good news, when your spouse sins against you, you will be able to say with all sincerity, you've wronged me. And I've wronged my great spouse, Jesus Christ, that he continues to cover me and keep me and forgive me. And because he loves me completely and unconditionally, I can love you completely and unconditionally as well. And the more that you humble yourselves before one another and before God, the more he will change you to reflect his matchless glory by making you more and more like Jesus. Marriage is an illustration of grace. And marriage is an instrument of God's grace. Michael and Marco, before you exchange your vows, I have one final reminder for you. And for all of you who are married here today, no matter how well you love and forgive one another, no matter how wonderful your marriage is, it's temporary in light of eternity. David reminds us in Psalm 103, the Lord himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Your relationship with God through Jesus Christ will outlive your marriage. And that's why God and not your spouse must be your only foundation. Any joy that we experience in marriage here on earth is a mere shadow of the joy that we will experience when we're joined together with our Lord and Savior. 
We're about to have a party. But one day there will be a wedding feast so joyful, so far beyond anything we could possibly imagine, a celebration of Christ's marriage to us as his bride, the church. And scripture pro proclaims, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And until that day when the Lord returns or he calls you home, may your marriage point others to Christ and may your marriage point one another to Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to offer you great thanks and praise today for the perfect example of unselfish love shared by you and your Son and your Spirit. And we ask for your blessing on Michael and Martha as they begin their new life together in the covenant of holy marriage. And we pray that you would use their marriage not only as an illustration of your grace to the watching world, but also as an instrument of your grace as they submit their lives to one another and to you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Michael, do you take Marco to be your wife? Do you promise to love her faithfully through every trial and hardship of life, to provide for her every physical need, to give loving devotion to her in the same manner that Christ showed devotion by dying for the church, and to live with her until separated by death? Then repeat after me. I, Michael, take you, Martha, to be my wedded wife. And I promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful husband. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, honor, and cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Marco, do you take Michael to be your husband? Do you promise to love him faithfully through every trial and hardship of life? To respond to Michael's provision and love for you? To submit to him in accordance with God's word and to live with him until separated by death? Then repeat after me. I, Marco, take you, Michael, to be my wedded husband. And I promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your loving and faithful wife. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love honor and cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Man has always used symbols to express the inexpressible, and the ring has long served as a symbol for sealing important commitments. And in the marriage relationship, the ring is a very important symbol. The marriage ring is a circle with no beginning and no end, which symbolizes God's everlasting love for you, Michael, and for you, Marco, and your pledge of abiding love and faithfulness. The marriage ring is made out of precious metal, which symbolizes the very sacred nature of this covenant. And the marriage ring is worn in public, so that all who see it will know of the covenant that you've made before God. And after today, your rings will provide the evidence that a wedding actually took place. And your rings will represent your vows and your lifelong commitment to one another. And have the rings. Michael, place the ring on your finger and repeat after me. Marco, I give you this ring as a symbol of my vow. And with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Marco, place the ring on his finger and repeat after me. Michael, I give you this ring as a symbol of my vow. And with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God has given us many tangible signs that picture his deep abiding love for his people in Christ. 
And one of those signs, as hopefully we are demonstrating today, is the institution of marriage. And another sign of his glorious gospel is communion. So it's fitting that Michael and Marco, for their first act as a married couple, have decided to celebrate the gift of God's love by sharing the Lord's Supper with you, their closest family and friends. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, and after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is not an empty ritual, but this is an act of faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a follower of Him, if you've placed your trust in Jesus as your only hope for salvation, then Michael and Marco and I invite you to come forward and share in this holy meal. Simply take the, the bread and dip it in the wine and take, share the Lord's Supper together. As we sing together, Jesus, I'm a cross of taken.
Oh 
Praise our, our great God and Father who has given us this beautiful day and, and brought you together. And, uh, and we, we pray his, his richest blessings on your marriage, that uh, uh, you would honor him and glorify him all your life long. And uh, we just uh, thank, thank you, uh, Lord, for bringing all of these friends and relatives here today to enjoy this, this moment with us. We praise you. We give you all the glory. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I come before you as one who has been greatly blessed by your steadfast love and faithfulness. I thank you for all your many and abundant blessings. Amongst the greatest blessings are my wonderful wife, Debbie, and our four amazing children. As father of Mariko, I want to express my deep thanksgiving for her and the wonderful woman she has become. I thank you for Mike and the excellent man he is, and for the family into which they are now united. You have blessed my daughter richly with an excellent husband, and for that, Debbie and I are very grateful. I pray for your blessing on the marriage and life, and the marriage and life together. Bless the relationship, give them joy and knowledge of the active working of the loving Holy Spirit of God in their life. Strengthen their unity and desire to live their lives in your service and for your glory. Bless their family with your Holy Spirit and protect them from illness, injury, and evil. Provide for their needs and guide them in all their ways. It is into your hands we entrust them. We pray that you would bless them in all ways, that your blessing would be on them in far more ways than we can hope or know to pray. Shower and protect them with the abundant power and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and keep them warm. Because you've pledged your love and loyalty to each other, and because you've sealed your pledge with the marriage rings, by the authority, vest, authority vested in me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you husband and wife. What God has joined together, let no man separate. You may kiss your breath. <laughs> Thank 
to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Michael and Mariko Kubinek. If you just come right down this way, you can you can uh, come and celebrate. Wait wait to see the bride and the groom as soon as dinner is served. <laughs> 